Welcome. Brother Eric John Phelps here with you at 24-7 World Radio. As I post all my broadcasts on my 24-7 World Radio site, and you can just go there and then click on uh, Archive Shows, and go on down and then click on EJP2, and this will be under Hour 2. So, I think Brother Vlad is also posting these on YouTube, so it'll be there for a while till they take it down, I'm sure. So, welcome to the broadcast today on September the 7th, 2023. It is a Thursday. And I had a dear brother in England. He's just been saved for four or, four or five months here. Uh, brother Josh. And he asked me a question with regard to when do I believe the end times began? So, I put together a reply that's about two pages. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to just put this in a form of broadcast and devote it to my dear white brother in Christ and brother Josh in England. And so this is for you, my brother. Um, I will be now addressing this question that you've had. Are we in? <clears throat> or when do I believe the last times began? So. He writes to me and he asks me, Hello again, Mr. Phelps. And he has a few things to say about um, somebody he spoke with from South Africa, a brother in Christ who was wrong about a couple of matters. And uh, he asked me, When do you think the end times began, Mr. Phelps? So, I will now address that for you, Brother Josh. Before we read the Bible, we have three maxims that we must always adhere to. Three biblical principles that must always be observed, or else we will arise or arrive in some form of heresy or heretical conclusion. Heresy being something that is not true. And uh, we want to avoid it as much as possible. I mean, we can advocate certain heresies. The Apostle Paul talks about heresy being a work of the flesh. And there are heresies are among you, talking to the church, the body of Christ. So it's possible for those of us to espouse heresies, although not purposely doing so, but because of our erroneous method of reading the scriptures. For example, the great John Wycliffe, who was the morning star of the Protestant Reformation in Northern Europe, in white Northern Europe, advocated the heresy that the Roman papacy was the beast of Revelation 13. And hence we have certain groups advocating that same heresy. Seventh-day Adventists are one of them advocating that the beast is the Roman Catholic institution. And that is a doctrine of John Wycliffe. That is not a doctrine of the Bible because it's in violation of one of the key cardinal hermeneutics. You like that word, hermeneutics? When I first heard hermeneutics, I was looking for Herman. <laughs> one of the hermeneutics of essential and comprehensible Bible reading, and that is we read the prophecies literally. We read them literally. I devoted a broadcast to this uh, a couple of months ago. It's posted on my website there. If you go, you can listen to it. But we read the prophecies literally because the Lord Jesus Christ read the prophecies literally. The Lord Jesus Christ did not read the prophecies allegorically. In other words, we're not going to read it literally, and we're going to put in there, we're going to decide what it means on our own, it's going to be our own interpretation, and we don't care what anybody else thinks. That's allegorical reading that originated in Alexandria, Egypt, by that chief heretic named Origen. That's the font of allegorical interpretation. Hence, can any good thing come out of Alexandria? <laughs> So, 
We read the scripture literally. Our second method of biblical hermeneutics, our second principle or biblical hermeneutic, the way in which we read the Bible is we read it in context. We do not take a verse out of context and build an eschatology around it, build a doctrine of future things around it. Eschatology meaning last things or the doctrine of eschatology. We don't do that. We keep that verse in the context in which we read it. Hence, we read it literally and we read it in context. Two great safeguards. Our third safeguard, our third biblical hermeneutic or principle of reading the Bible is we always distinguish between the nation of Israel and the church, the body of Christ. There are two separate entities that shall never be combined. The nation of Israel, as I've taught many times before, is a composed of a racial people by way of the 12 sons of Abraham, of Jacob, pardon me. You've got Abraham, you got Jacob, you got Jacob, and then you have his 12 sons. One of those sons is Judah. Out of Judah will come the Lord's Christ, pursuant to Genesis 49. The Hebrews, speaking the language of Hebrew, are by nation Israelites, and they are also termed Jews, as we read in the book of Jeremiah. All Jews are not Hebrews, but all Hebrews are Jews, as I have taught many times before. The church, the body of Christ, is composed of many nations and many nationalities and many languages. Revelation 5.9. Maybe I should go there. Revelation 5.9. We read concerning, concerning the church, the body of Christ. In Revelation 5.9, we read 24 elders, I believe. Um, we have verse 8. And when he had taken the book, when Christ has taken the book out of the hand of the Father, sitting on the throne in chapter 5, verse 1, the sat on the throne, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts, those are the four cherubim, and four and twenty elders, which are members of the church, they're men, members of the church body of Christ, apparently representing the entire body of Christ, but there are literal men here, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they, these 24 elders, sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Those are the six seals of Revelation 6. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people and nation. A kindred has to do with a race of people. The word race is not used in the New Testament, but it is synonymous with a kindred and a people and an ethnos of nation. A nation is composed of a race, having speaking a certain language, living in a certain geographical boundary of a nation. That's what a nation is. That's what God has instituted in Genesis 10. Anyone who wants to race mix the nations is doing the devil's work, just as was done at the Tower of Babel when the race mixing took place and the nation mixing took place, when they only had one language at, at that time. And they all came together for, which, for that judgment that God would pour out upon them, and that would be the institution of languages, to further separate the races of mankind by language. God does not want miscegenation. God does not want race mixing. He does not want nation mixing. He wants the nations, known by their race, their language, their culture, to maintain their identity, as this is the best economy for mankind at this time. I don't want to go to Sweden and see a bunch of blacks, and I don't want to go to Nigeria and see a bunch of white people. We have our different racial, ethnic, and linguistical differences and, I, and we are to live on within certain boundaries. That's a nation. So, let me see here. 
Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. By the way, we will maintain our national identity forever. We will maintain our racial identity forever. We will maintain our language forever. And I believe we'll speak all the languages, those of us in Christ. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And so the church, the body of Christ, as being represented by these 24 men, these elders, and they are masculine, so they're men. There's no women here. That's what they've said. And so we will reign with Christ on earth. When? We will reign with him during his thousand-year millennial reign, when he rules the world from Jerusalem. After his second coming, yet to happen. So we see the church, the body of Christ, is made up of many different nations, but the nation of Israel is only one nation and is composed of 12 tribes. 12 tribes of Israel. They are racial 12 tribes. We see, and God is preserving those tribes at this very moment. At this very moment, he is preser preserving the tribes according to the Apostle Peter, we read, remember Peter was the apostle to the Jews, James was the apostle to the Jews, John was an apostle to the Jews, the nation of Israel, Paul was the apostle to the nations. So, 1 Peter 1, he's writing in chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So he's writing, the apostle Peter is writing to Jews that are dispersed. He was the apostle to the Jews, to the Hebrews. We also see in the book of James the very same thing. James was also a minister to the nation of Israel also a minister to the nation of Israel. We read here, James, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So, at this time when James writes this epistle, which is around AD 50, some 20 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, the 12 tribes are still preserved. They have still been preserved. And these 12 tribes will continue to be preserved until the fullness of the Gentiles takes place. In other words, the last Gentile is saved and placed into the body of Christ. How do we know that? Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, the Apostle Paul is speaking and contrasting the nation of Israel with the church. And he says, verse 24, For if thou wert, if you Gentiles were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, that good olive tree is the nation of Israel, how much more shall these that is the nation of Israel, which be the natural branches, the racial Hebrew Jewish Israelites with the promise of the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant that have not been fulfilled yet, be grafted into their own olive tree. Verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The fullness of the Gentiles is the church, the body of Christ. Revelation 5.9 So, the nation of Israel has been temporarily set aside. God is not dealing with the nation of Israel, spiritually. Israel will never be converted to Christ until just prior to the second coming, according to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Why? Because the spirit of grace has been poured out upon the nation. Isaiah 66, 8 says, Can a nation be born in a day? Absolutely, it will be born in a day when the spirit of God is poured out upon it. 
The Spirit of God has not yet been poured out upon the nation of Israel pursuant to Joel chapter 3. Hasn't happened. And Joel 2. The day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter says, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, my spirit should be poured out, and so on. But it wasn't poured out on Israel. It was poured out only on the, it was on the twelve, which was not a fulfillment of Joel. So the nation of Israel has yet to have the Spirit of God poured out upon it. It is yet to be saved nationally. But for that to happen, the nation of Israel, composed of the twelve tribes, or actually thirteen tribes, because the tribe of Joseph was divided into Ephraim and Manasseh, those tribes have to be preserved to inherit the millennial kingdom and the blessing of Genesis 49, where Jacob pronounced the blessing on his 12 sons and what would come to pass in the last days. And the last days concerns, in that context, the first and second coming of Christ. So, back to our point. We must always distinguish between the nation of Israel and the Gentile nations. The gospel of Jesus Christ is going out to all nations right now, has been since the resurrection of Christ and his ascension, actually since the day of Pentecost, when they were endued with power from on high to preach the gospel, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, where the half-Jews were, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, which the Apostle Paul began with his evangelistic journeys. So, we are living right now, as I will teach you, as I have taught in the past, in a time warp. We are living between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel. And yes, there is a gap of time between the 69th and 70th week. If you do not believe that, you are not reading the prophecy literally, as I have taught many times before. The prophecy begins with a command to restore and build Jerusalem, which is in Nehemiah chapter 2 not Ezra chapter 7. Ezra has to do with the temple. Nehemiah has to do with Jerusalem. So, there is a difference between Israel and the church. There will always be a difference between Israel and the church. Israel is composed of a specific race of people derived from Jacob and his four wives, out of which came the 12 tribes, that is a race of people, and they must be preserved if God is to keep his word. And we see that they are being preserved for the future day of the coming 70th week of Daniel that will take place during the last days for the nation of Israel. Because as I show you, the latter, the latter times, the, la the latter times are for the church. The last days are for the nation of Israel. So, again, to make my point here that the twelve tribes are being preserved at this moment, we read chapter 7 of Revelation, and we see verse 2, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in, our, in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. There were sealed 144,000. Not the Jehovah Witness heresy. These are 144,000 of all the tribes of the nation of Israel. So there's 12,000 from each tribe. And I won't bore you with naming them, but you can read them for yourself. If that's the case, those racial tribes are, in, are being preserved to this very moment, in spite of the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust that Hitler and Stalin and FDR and Churchill and Mussolini and Franco all participated in because all those dictators worked together subject to the Jesuit order. It wasn't just the Germans who did it, or just Hitler who did it. Without Stalin and Churchill and FDR, it ain't happening. And as I prove that in my book, Vatican Assassins. So, you have 12,000 from each tribe being preserved at this moment. 
Another proof that the 12 tribes are being preserved at this moment, even though Israel has been set aside till the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. We read in the book of Ezekiel, the last chapter, Ezekiel 48, concerning the division of the land, because you see the land promise given to Abraham has never been fulfilled. And so in Ezekiel 48, we see the land division, as the Messiah has come, he's, he's built the fourth Hebrew temple. He's going to, well, verse in chapter 43, we read here in verse 7, And he said unto me, verse 5, So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne... This man is the pre-incarnate Son of God. The man that's standing by Ezekiel. He's the eternal Son. He says, And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne. What throne is that? This is the Davidic throne. And the place of the soles of my feet. This, this man has feet and soles. So he's going to be manifest in the flesh one of these days. And of course he was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar when he begins his ministry. Where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. For that to happen, the children of Israel as a race of people must be preserved. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. So, here we have the eternal Son of God, yet to be made flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sit on his throne of David in this Hebrew temple, which is this house that he will build, as described in Ezekiel 40, and so on. It's a beautiful place. And during this time, the tribes will inherit their land promises. We read in Ezekiel 48, verses 1 through 7, of the tribes existing, and they getting their land. There'll be a sanctuary where a temple of the Lord shall be in the midst thereof, because he's going to build a fourth Hebrew temple. The third Hebrew temple is going to build, be built sometime in the next several years after war in Israel. There has to be war for the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque to be destroyed so that the third Hebrew temple can be built. So we read, the Levites don't have any land, and then we see another set of tribes. They're going to get their land in verses 22 to 27. And the rest of the tribes get their land. So that's all 12 tribes. For Ezekiel 48 to be literally fulfilled, the racial Hebrew Jewish Israelites composing, composed of the 12 tribes must be preserved at this moment. Because when God's done saving his church, the body of Christ, all those elect whose names have been written before the foundation of the earth that was, that was laid uh, in Genesis 1, 2, actually 1, 1. When the elect are saved, then God's going to deal with the nation of Israel again. And so shall out of Zion shall come the deliverer and turn ungodliness away from Jacob. Martin Luther believed this. It's in Nicholas Lenker's History of Martin Luther. It's in Volume 1. Luther never believed in replacement theology, nor did he ever write on the Jews and their lies. That is a bold-faced lie, which I have proven to be true. And if you're interested, contact me. I will offer the manuscript to you for a price. You need to pay for it because Germany was decimated, having been blamed for the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust, specifically the Lutheran Church, when the fact is it was Pius XII and his Jesuit, Vladimir Lederchowski, his Jesuit general and other Jesuits, that brought about the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust, who were in Russia and Germany, throughout Europe and America and England, bringing about the design of that horrible, terrible disaster to so as to drive the remaining Jews into Palestine, or which would, would, would one be called the nation of Israel. Without the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust by the Pope, there's no revived Latin kingdom of Jerusalem belonging to the Pope. Because the Pope 
rules the government of Israel, just like he rules the government here in America. They all are ruled by the Jesuits, overseen by the black pope, and the black pope orchestrates everything through the white pope and his hierarchy. All right, so we see the difference between Israel and, and um, the church. Then we see we have to read everything in context. And if we don't read in context, then it becomes a pretext for a heresy. So, I'll give you a classic example of that. Now let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Christ is speaking to the disciples as Israelites. He's not speaking to the church in Matthew 24. The church is not going through great tribulation. Of verse 21. The church is not going to see the abomination of desolation. Of verse 15, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. He's talking to the disciples as Israelites, as Hebrews, as racial Jews in Matthew 24. And he talks about what's going to happen and uh, the terrible things that will be coming on the earth. And then he says, concerning that time, that you need to endure until the end. We see here, verse 22, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. He's talking to the disciples as members of the nation of Israel, as his disciple. And later goes on, he talks about after the tribulation, you have the coming of the Son of Man. Son of Man is a messianic term in Daniel chapter 7. And he then will, he warns them, heaven and earth is going to pass away. And then he talks about the days of Noah. So shall it be in the Son of Man, day of the coming of the Son of Man. And he says here, be ready. For you know not when the Son of Man cometh. He's talking to the disciples as Jews, as the nation of Israel. And he goes on to say, in another particular passage, that he that, in, that endureth to the end shall be saved. Verse 13, thank you, Lord. Matthew 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This is those that living during this time of great tribulation, if they endure to the end of it without being killed, they shall be saved and enter into the millennial kingdom of Christ. This has nothing to do with the gospel of grace and salvation today. Those who believe this believe in work salvation, that you have to endure to the end. End of what? End of your life? It's not reading, reading it literally, nor is it being, reading, being read in context. We're taking it out of the context, using it a pretext for work salvation. So don't take any particular prophecy out of context. This is a prophecy of the eternal Son of God manifest in the flesh, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Okay. So we distinguish between the nation of Israel and the church. We, we read the scripture literally, the prophecies literally, and we keep them in context. Those are our three hermeneutics, our three rules in reading and understanding the scripture. We shall now begin to distinguish between the terms the latter times of 1 Timothy 4.1 and the last days of 2 Timothy 3.1. So, we'll deal with the latter times first. The latter times is a little phrase, the underlying words, what, Hysterios Kairos, the little Greek phrase is translated latter times, and most correctly. But it's not the same phrase, the same Greek phrase for the last days, which is eschatos Eremus, Hurais, Hita Mu Epsilon Rho, yeah, Hurais, Eschatos, Hurais, 
latter days. So you have the latter times versus the last days, two specifically different Greek phrases, and rightfully translated by our beloved 47 learned and godly men, King James translators. So let's first talk about the latter times. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving to them that which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Well, notice here that the apostle, by the Spirit of God, says the Spirit speaks expressly. The Spirit is speaking expressly now, and I maintain that the, the Scripture that's been uh, inspired, has been given by dictation to those who were used to write it. Oh, well, he gave it in dictation of the, of the grammatical abilities of the authors, but the Spirit of God told him. And by the way, I believe John Calvin believed in dictation, too, and some other, some other heretics. There's no room for error here. The Spirit, the, the Scriptures are inspired, and the men that were used to write them were moved, God-breathed by the Spirit. Moved by the Spirit, and the Scriptures are God-breathed. Okay? So we see here, the Spirit speak expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. He's talking about those members of the church, the body of Christ. How do we know that? Well, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That in the latter times of the church, the body of Christ, some, some of these people that claim to know the Lord shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing spirits are demons. Demons specializing in doctrine to push a heresy to bring that church into to chastisement of God. Giving heed, listening to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, doctrines of devils. There are doctrines of devils, many of them. Two, speaking lies in hypocrisy. They're hypocrites having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Their conscience doesn't even convict them of right and wrong anymore. They have a seared conscience. I've met some men like that. Now it goes on, verse 3, forbidding to marry. Why, what religious institution do you know of forbids marriage to its priests? And I'll give you three guesses, and the first two don't count. This is the condemnation of Babylonian Roman Catholicism, forbidding their priests to marry. There's, there was a great book written by Justin Fulton, namely, Why Priests Should Wed. And he gets in it and shows that how the, all the immorality in the confessional among the priests would disappear if they had their own wives. But oh no, this is war. The priests are warriors. And we cannot have warriors going into battle with wives and families. So therefore, it's a doctrine of the papacy. Papacy, I believe, it was Gregory, Gregory the Great, who came out with the doctrine of celibacy, wickedness, sinfulness. And there was a time when Rome had Bible-believing members. There was a time when Rome was a real church, as the apostle writes the epistle to the Romans. But it goes apostate with, I believe, the first pope. I think it's Boniface the third in 606. So Rome goes apostate, but before then there were Roman Christians. I mean, Erasmus, who's the one that God used to gather together the manuscripts for Tyndall and Luther to give us our Reformation Bibles, he was a Catholic priest who never left the church, even though they hated him. So God used him to get the manuscripts, the Texas Receptus, to us, to Luther and Tyndall, so we would have the Luther and the AV 1611 English Bibles, out of which would come the German Empire, the Second Protestant Reich, um, with Prussia, and the wonderful and great British Empire that would be a great boon to preaching the gospel and commerce until the Jesuits would take it over with King 
king, what was it, George III. But going on, we read, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So, no meat on Friday. That's a, that's a heresy. That's a doctrine of devils. When the Catholics couldn't eat on Friday. Or was it just fish on Friday? I mean, something crazy. That's Romanism. It's doctrines of demons, devils, the Bible teaches. And this happened in the latter times, the latter times of the church. And I think the church went into the latter times when, after the first three centuries, it becomes corrupted, at least openly, with Origen and these other heretics and Jerome. And uh, they, the church is going to go underground for a thousand years and surface at the Reformation. It's possible, but or maybe it's simply the latter times of this dispensation of the grace of God. Who knows when it actually began? But one thing for sure, I believe we're in the latter times of the church, the body of Christ, because there are so many seducing spirits, so many doctrines of devils, so many liars, so many supposed Christian men with their conscience, so woo, so seared that they will not tell you right from wrong, as Billy Graham, when Billy Graham will tell you that the Pope was the greatest moral leader in the world. I mean, what do you expect from a 33rd degree Freemason? conscience seared with a hot iron have no sense of guilt then of course the doctrine of the papacy he can't get married and can't eat meat on certain days so these are the latter days for the church it's not the latter days for Israel the context has to do with the church so let's go now and talk about the last days in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 this know also that in the last days, this term last days cannot be understood unless you're familiar with that term in the Old Testament. It is an Old Testament term. It is not a New Testament term. So we shall examine some of the uses of the term last days in the Old Testament. But the Apostle Paul says here, by the Spirit of God, and know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. So during these times, there's going to be perilous times, life-threatening times, peril. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors. A traitor be betrays his nation. To be a traitor is to be against nationalism. That's why all Bible believers, if they've been properly reading the scripture, are nationalists. They want to pardon me, they want to preserve their nation. They're not for nation mixing. Traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. That's what's going to be in these last days. And the apostle then is telling Timothy, from such, from there will be these kinds of men that will be living during this dispensation of grace. There will be these kinds of men living in the latter in the uh, latter times, in the latter days. Pardon me. In the latter times. Pardon me. There will be these kinds of men living in the latter times of the church, because he says, of such. From such, turn away. There will be these kinds of men that exist during this dispensation, and we're to turn away from them. But it doesn't mean we're in the last days. It doesn't mean the church is in the last days. The church has no last days. Last days is exclusively for the nation of Israel. The, the church has its latter times. But it has no last days. Latter times versus last days. Latter times for the church, last days for Israel. So, he's talking about this. Now, I want you to see that the term last days begins with the coming of Christ. But there is a 
there is a time warp now. The last days have been set aside for a while till the fullness of the Gentiles comes. And then the last days will resume with the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. How do we know that? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, same phrase that we find in 2 Timothy. Indeed, it's the same phrase except in another case that we find in 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. These are the last days for the nation of Israel. And notice here, the term is being used to the Hebrews, those composing the nation of Israel, that, those that are saved that are part of the nation of Israel. The writer is speaking to saved Hebrews. All Hebrews are Jews, but not all Jews are Hebrews. All Hebrews are Israelites. And so the Apostle Paul, because he wrote Hebrews, anybody that denies it doesn't know true church history, which tells us that the reason why Hebrews is in the canon is because the early believers, the men who were, I hate to call them church fathers, that's, that's Catholic terminology, the, the men who were leading things in the first century believed and knew the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews, and for that reason alone, Hebrews is in the New Testament canon. It's the last of the books the Apostle is going to be used to write by the Spirit of God, and the Apostle has written 14 of them, over half the New Testament. And so we read here, Hebrews chapter 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Who are the fathers? The fathers of the nation of Israel. The God spoke by the, prop, by the prophets to the fathers. He spoke to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He spoke to the 12 tribes. He spoke to the prophets. He spoke to David by Nathan. David was a father of the Davidic covenant. He spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, he made the ages. Because there are many different ages. We know there are seven different ages in our New Testament, but there, I'm sure there are many more of that because there are ages to come in Revelation chapter 21, 22. Well, Christ authored them all. The pre-incarnate Son of God made the ages at the command of the Father, and he did so in the power of the Holy Ghost. So, in these last days, he's spoken unto us by his Son. The last days of Israel began when Messiah comes. That's exactly what Hebrews tells us here. These are the last days of Israel. When Messiah comes, in the fullness of time, God sends forth his Son. The fullness of time begins the last days. These last days are also referred to as the fullness of the time was come. Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's the fullness of the time. Hebrews calls that the last days. So the last days concern the nation of Israel, and in Hebrews 1, the coming of Christ to his elect nation of Israel, which was the purpose why he came. He did not come to establish the church, the body of Christ. That was done after his rejection, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And beginning on the day of Pentecost, this was new. There's no such thing as the body of Christ in the Old Testament. There is only Israel and the nations. There is no church in the Old Testament unless you want to adopt the heresy that the church is now Israel, which is Roman, Romish, pagan, Roman Catholic, eschatology, heresy. The church has never become Israel. Israel will never become the church. And forever the two will be ever identified as different households during which they lived during a different period of time, a different economy called a dispensation. And we know dispensations are true because in Ephesians chapter 3, we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. 
right now, where God is extending the gospel to whosoever will of all the nations. It's grace, grace, repent, be saved, have your sins forgiven. Now is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late because when the appearing of Christ takes place and the elect are saved, there's going to be no gospel of grace anymore. Now it's going towards the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, which will begin in Daniel 9.27. When the princess shall come, shall confirm a covenant with many for, one, for seven years, for, for one week. And then in the midst of that week, he causes the sacrifice and daily oblation to cease in the third Hebrew temple. And he goes down there and he demands to be worshipped as God for three and a half years. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I've preached much about this. And when he does that, that begins. That, well, actually, it kicks in. The beginning of the 70th week kicks in the, the continuation and the continuing on of the last days that have been put on hold since the rejection of Christ. Because when Christ rides into Jerusalem on the colt, the full of an ass, ass in Luke, uh, what, 19, he's fulfilling Daniel 9, 26, 25, from the command to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince, the very day he declares himself the Messiah, pursuing to Zechariah 9, 9, he's fulfilling that 69th week, and Israel's in the last days that was spoken to by the Son of God, according to Hebrews chapter 1. But in his rejection, the last days for Israel are put on hold. And we live now during the dispensation of the grace of God, the church, the body of Christ, during which towards the end of it will be the latter times. Of 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. So, the last days has to do with the time of persecution, the time of great peril, the perilous times that we read, we read about in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, during the last half of the seven-year period of the prophet Daniel given to him by the angel Gabriel in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. So, <clears throat> going to be perilous times during that 42 month period that's when the beast the antichrist the man the man that has a number 666 that everybody will have to take or his mark or his name that's the time when he'll rule the world absolutely for 42 months those are perilous times <clears throat> those are the last days for the nation of israel and except the Lord cut short those days. No elect of the nation of Israel would be saved. Matthew 24, talking to Israel, not to the church. So, let's read some final verses on the last days. We read in Genesis 49. Genesis 49, verses... Chapter 1 and verses 9 through 12. Genesis 49, verse 1, and then 9 through 12. Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. This is the law of first mention, the time this phrase is ever used. Last days has to do with the nation of Israel. But that's the way that's another hermeneutic. Another hermeneutic is the law of first mention. The law of first mention as a word or phrase is used. That meaning shall carry through unless the context determines that it shall not. It's called the law of first mention. Okay. So here's what's going to happen to you, to you boys in the last days. And then all these sons, these 12 sons will be preserved for the last days. Now let's read concerning Judah. Verse 9, Judah is a lion's wealth. This is where we get the term, the phrase, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We read it in Revelation chapter 5, Weep not, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is able to take the scroll and open the seven seals thereof. Who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ. And then I saw as a, a lamb. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is also the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. So, he's a lion's well. From, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. 
and as an old lion. And that's right, because he's eternal. He's from everlasting, according to Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, whose goings forth have been from old for everlasting. The one born in Bethlehem. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. By the way, the erudite individual who wrote on the Jews and their lies made a very good explanation for this. Now, it had to be some Jesuit, and it was written in the late 1800s. But he talks about that there was a there was a Shiloh, there was a lawgiver until Christ came through the family of Judah. Now remember, on the Jews and their lies is a is, a, is ultimately to target the Jews and and uh, persecute them and and uh, burn all their synagogues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's a very erudite author in there, and there's probably several of them, and they deal with Genesis 49 in that in that work. Scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now look at verse 11. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. This is Christ's first coming. This is when he rides into Jerusalem on the ass's colt, and the mother of the colts right there with them. He's probably leaning on her or whatever. But he's riding a colt that's never been ridden before. This is exactly what Zechariah 9.9 9 said that he would have to fulfill in the coming of Messiah, the king of Jerusalem. And so we read here in verse 11 of Genesis 49.11, binding his foal into the vine. He rides down from the Mount of Olives. He goes down that little valley in there. He comes up. He enters the gate. When he gets there, he binds his foal to the vine and it asses colt to the choice vine. Evidently did that before he goes into the temple. Now we have going to have a gap of time between the word vine and he. Notice here, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's Revelation 14, 20. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. This is the second coming. So you have the first coming and the second coming of Christ referred to as the last days for the tribe of Judah. And that's why Hebrews talks about the coming of Christ in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, during the last days. This is the last days that Jacob spoke about when he talked to his son Judah. And the last days for Judah will include the comings, both comings of Christ, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And so after the last days... Here, when Christ comes, he's rejected. The last days are put on hold. We're in the latter times of the church. The last days will begin again with the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. And in the last half of time, perilous times, terrible times, perilous times, the international rule of the beast man, the Antichrist. And then Christ shall come, and he shall deliver his elect nation of Israel, and then establish his Davidic kingdom. We read here, concerning the last days of Israel that will be the millennial kingdom. We read Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 and following. We read, Isaiah 2. Verse 1, and the, word of the, of, and the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the last days, there's the term, last days, last days of Hebrews 1, last days of Genesis 49, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. That's Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And there'll be a house there, which is a temple. So there'll be a fourth Hebrew temple described in Ezekiel that will be built. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. The highest mountain on the Lord's flat earth at this time will be Zion in Jerusalem. The valley shall be brought up. The mountain shall be made low. The singular mountain in the earth will be Mount Zion in Jerusalem. It's the place that all nations will go to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, according to Zechariah chapter 14. And... Uh, and shall be exalted above the hills. 
and all nations shall flow into it. Maybe that's why the devil took Christ upon a high mountain and offered him all the kingdoms of the world because the devil had read Isaiah and the devil knew that this man, this very son of God, man Christ Jesus he was tempting would one day be on a very high mountain ruling all the kingdoms of the world over this flat earth. By the way, how can the devil show Christ all the kingdoms of the world from a high mountain if the earth is a globe? It's ridiculous. Unless they took a magic carpet ride or something. So we read, And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, the one that Jacob wrestled with. Yeah, that's the pre-incarnate Son of God. That's the God of Jacob, the one he wrestled with, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the temple, in the house of the Lord, in the millennial kingdom. To the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, that's in Jerusalem, that's the mountain that's to be established, of which Jerusalem will be built upon, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, this God of Jacob, the Lord Jesus Christ shall judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And the, and the heretic, the, the infidel who put some of that scripture on the, on the Statue of Liberty knows full well there's no peace until the Prince of Peace arrives. So here he is. It's in the last days. This is the millennial kingdom. This is when Christ rules the world with a rod of iron. The last days also include the thousand year reign of Christ. The last days include the 70th week, specifically the great tribulation, the last half, then as well as the millennial reign of Christ. We see another prophet here. Micah. Micah chapter 4. It's almost word for word for Isaiah chapter 2. But in the last days, here it is, in the last days, I got to read the previous verse. Micah 3, verse 12. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. This is exactly what the Roman Emperor Hadrian did when he plowed Jerusalem in A.D. 135. The Lord spoke it, and that's what this wicked sinner did, as the Lord foreknew it. But now, in chapter 4, we're going to jump ahead some 2,000 years into the future between verse 12 of chapter 3 and verse 1 of chapter 4. But in the last days... It shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But, it goes on, which we didn't have in Isaiah, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, hath spoken it. Verse 6, In that day saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halteth a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. That's the Davidic kingdom. It will be established. Jerusalem will be the world capital. And nations will flow into it. And this happens when? In the last days. The last days of Genesis 49. The last days of Isaiah chapter 2. The last days of Micah chapter 4. Have to do with the nation of Israel. And when Christ came at his first coming, as we saw in Genesis 49... 
That was the last days for Israel according to Hebrews chapter 1. But the last days were put on hold until this dispensation of the grace of God is fulfilled. And then when that's fulfilled and the, and the elect are saved, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then God will translate us out. Indeed, the appearing of Christ, some call it the rapture, I call it the appearing, will take place. We'll be transferred out of here pursuant to 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's the departure. Hey, apostia. Uh, that's the departure. The departure from this world. And then shall the 70th week later begin, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who then the Lord will slay at his second coming in the last days of Israel, because they're perilous times, and then he will establish his Davidic kingdom, which are the last days of Israel, in which there will be no war, no sickness, very little death, and Israel shall be the greatest nation on the face of the Lord's flat earth. The mountain that Jerusalem will be on will be Zion. All of us that are saved will be there with the Lord in our glorified bodies, delightfully there, and administering the Davidic kingdom as we as were ordered to by the Lord Jesus Christ to our utter delight and fullness of our purpose. Yeah. Okay. In conclusion, the latter times have to do with the church. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. The last days have to do with Israel, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. I trust this has been a blessing to you. It's always a delight to review this. And uh, I trust, Brother Josh, that you've enjoyed this. So until next time, Lord bless. Brother Eric John Phillips, thank you for tuning in. I have a book, Vatican Assassins, Wounded in the House of My Friends. Please go to my website, vaticanassassins.org, and pick up an ebook. Also, there are other things there that you can purchase for your edification. And go to 247worldradio.com. You can purchase my broadcast there and some other things. Of course, take my private citizenship class, of which all of you need until our county or our state declares its independence from District of Columbia. And we can return to a pre-March 9, 1933 private citizen of the United States. So until next time, Lord bless. Maranatha.